Uh, hello and welcome to what is our sixth Market Outlook webinar for this year and uh, today's discussion which will be taking a look at the current state of the oil and gas project market with a particular focus on spending trends being tracked across the Americas. Uh, and this particular webinar um, builds on a, on a series of uh, oil and gas webinars that we'll be conducting over the course of the year uh, and support two previous webinars we did earlier in the year covering Asia, Pacific, and the Middle East. So if you didn't have an opportunity to hear in and dial into those, uh, fear not, you're able to, you'll, you'll be able to log into our portal and, and hear those recordings. Um, my name is Shaheen Chahan, and I'll be one of your presenters today. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined by a couple of familiar faces and voices, our Vice President of Global Oil and Gas Research, Gordon Gorey, and Shane Mullins, who is our VP of Product Development, but also doubles up and wears two hats. Uh, Shane is our global natural gas subject matter expert. Uh, both Gordon and Shane uh, are based in our Sugarland, Texas head office. Before we start and, and jump into the numbers, uh, I would like to, first of all, just uh, say a very big thank you to our webinar sponsor, Parker Hannafin. Parker are a major global provider of motion and control technologies and have been serving the oil and gas sector for a number of years, well over 50 years. So many thanks to Parker for their support today. Now, I, I thought I would start uh, the session by just really taking a quick look at where we are right now in terms of the outlook for crude. Um, the Balancing Act really does continue to make ground. We've seen some decent and, and fairly solid demand growth for 2018, and that looks to remain fairly steady throughout the year. And obviously, that's being supported by adherence to those production cuts by OPEC members, and that's really helping support that rebalancing, as well as a little bit of support also from some um, increased declines coming out of Venezuela and some lower output in Africa, uh, certainly in this first quarter. And that's really resulted in global stocks being only marginally above that five-year average. But uh, there's obviously still a little bit of uh, cautiousness in the market. Uh, we do continue to see some fairly high volumes uh, of production increases coming out of the U.S. and obviously a lot of that uh, is finding its way into the export markets. We've seen ex U.S. Uh, crude exports increase uh, quite rapidly over the first quarter of this year and that could possibly soften some of the uh, work being done by OPEC, although there is an expectation that U.S. refining rates are going to improve. They're already up and that could help absorb a little bit of that increased U.S. production should those pipeline bottlenecks get resolved. Everybody's always interested in pricing. Uh, the forecasters, forecasters are out, uh, you know, and, and, and it varies. Most feel that maybe the late 60s uh, to $70 a barrel, mid 70s should look about right for, for, for this year. Um, and that's, of course, should there be no real material shocks to the market. And obviously that can't be guaranteed. Um, we are continuing to see some tensions in parts of the Middle East. Uh, and obviously that ongoing current trade war issue uh, is obviously not a positive backdrop to facilitating a, you know, a broader global economic growth picture, uh, and obviously the full, in, uh, you know, outcome of those U.S. In import tariffs has not really yet fully played out. So we don't know how those other countries are going to respond. But uh, looking at the chart, all looking very positive. The Rebalancing Act is continuing. The demand fundamentals are certainly there, pretty solid. Uh, and there's a, but there's a lot of side issues that could create a little bit of uh, price volatility going forward. So what does that mean for project spending, the actual numbers? Well, we can see here on the left, uh, yeah, a little over 430 billion is already under construction. Uh, that's already kicked off. And that's very much in, in, in line with what we've actually seen over the last 18 months, uh, those sorts of volumes. But more importantly, we can see this hefty 1.76 trillion that's uh, still active. Uh, it's either at the planning or the engineering stage. Now, we do need to treat some of that forward-looking pipeline with a little bit of caution. We know that not all of this will come to a successful construction kickoff, uh, as it certainly as, as laid out under current schedules. We will expect to see some degree of fallout from those numbers. Some of those projects will get cancelled. 
some of it will be put on hold, or more, more likely what we've seen over the last 24 months is a lot of that project spending will get pushed out. So what does that actually mean for the numbers? Now I know these, the, the, the table here looks a little small, so you're gonna have to trust me when I uh, walk you through the numbers. Um, I took a look at the, uh, our IIR analytics dashboard yesterday when I saw these numbers, and I saw what we can expect is around 49%, 50% realization rate, which equates to about 876 billion. Of that $1.7 uh, trillion should come to a successful uh, construction or kickoff start as currently planned under current market conditions. Now, if you haven't seen the analytics dashboard, it's available within our data platform. It provides a, a very nice view of across a number of spending indices to help generate a more realistic view of, of spending. Um, and what that eight, $867 billion consists of is it strips out the low probability projects as well as some of those projects which have um, already seen a high degree of start date slippage, three years or, or more. So what we can see is possibly a trimming back of that 1.7 trillion down to a, a little bit more meaningful uh, $867 billion or so. Right, uh, that's enough from me. Um, Shane, I'd, I'd really like to bring you into the discussion now and just really just throw you into this slide. Um, can you highlight a few themes that you're seeing from this particular top line view of the Americas? Well, uh, global demand, the oil price recovery and the efficiency gains that we've seen, uh, if you just start with the U.S., is allowing red counts to be up over 100, 150% from where we saw back in at the low point in May of 2016. Uh, at that point, we only had about 400 rig, rigs active in, in total. Uh, last week, we're flying by f about five rigs, and we're up 156 over this time last year. Uh, right now, we've got about 1,000 rigs deployed right now, which is, is which is about the equivalent of what 2,000 rigs could have uh, produced uh, just a few years ago because of productivity gains. Uh, the Marcellus and Utica basins have been ramping up production into a number of uh, pipeline takeaway projects that are starting up this year, and drilling activity continues to grow in the tide oil plays, especially in the uh, in the Permian Basin. Outside of the U.S. and Canada, uh, in Latin America, oil and gas production has been the most affected uh, since the price drop in, in 2014, but that uh, trend is starting to reverse. And we do see some more investment coming in from the recent blocks of production that have been released in Mexico and Brazil, but, but also in Argentina, Colombia, and Peru, uh, where we see uh, rig growth is, is starting to uh, improve in those areas as well. Uh, when you look at spending, there's about uh, 480 billion in active development, nearly 4,200 projects scheduled to kick off construction in the next 24 months or so. A lot of opportunity still exists to add to the 100 billion that's currently under construction. So, uh, Gordon, I'm going to hand this over to you to see if you wanted to comment a little bit on this. Uh, thanks, Shane. Um, when we compare these numbers to the similar or same presentation that we did about a year ago, the under construction dollar value is slightly lower this time but uh, with a higher pro project count. Uh, now, if we just compare the 24-month project count and TIV, the picture is slightly different in that the TIV is higher this time, taken up mainly by the US seeing a $70 billion increase, uh, followed by a $4 billion increase out of Mexico. Uh, overall, however, Latin America remains similar to this time last year, with notable of exceptions, in which Shane has briefly covered. That's in Brazil and Argentina, where both countries are seeing an upturn in project activity. Uh, obviously, the preceding slide will add more color uh, to why we are seeing more confidence in, in the market uh, for all of these regions. Shane, if I could come back to you and, and just start really taking a bit of a deeper dive into uh, the U.S. market. Um, we can clearly see from the composition of the spending here on that chart in the bottom left that there is uh, certainly a very big focus on natural gas. We see some very big volumes, and that just seems to keep growing uh, in terms of planned spending. But um, could you just share with us, do you feel that the levels of spending that we are seeing, uh, certainly looking forward, is it warranted and justified? Well, yes. I mean, at first, I, it, it, the levels are high. Uh, dry gas production is expected to reach 80 BCF this year, and that's way up from what we saw, 75 BCF last year. 
that's more growth than what uh, is, is being consumed in Argentina alone just in one year. Uh, we're going to grow production to 89 BCF by 2020. And the production growth that we're seeing today is being supported with the real step change in, the, in demand that's coming our way. I mean, if you look at LNG exports right now, we're exporting three BCF a day. That's going to grow to nine BCF a day by 2020. There's 31 gigawatts of new power generation currently under construction that's going to add about 4.5 uh, BCF a day of demand. Uh, if you look at the pipelines that are that are going to be coming online this year in Mexico, Mexico could easily be absorbing an additional two BCF a day if those lines had, had, have come online already. Uh, you're going to see industrial petrochemical demand uh, add another uh, BCF a day over the next year as these ethylene crackers start up uh, and, and ammonia methanol facilities come online. Uh, ethane recovery alone at, at the uh, gas processing plants, which are currently rejecting ethane and selling that as gas is going to add another 1.6 BCF of demand. So there's a lot of demand for additional gas production coming our way to support what we're seeing. And, and that's going to continue with the abundance of gas that can be economically developed. Uh, if you just look at the, uh, the record exports of LNG via Mexico and associated gas production in the uh, uh, tide oil in Appalachia, it, it, that's, that's going to be limiting Henry Hub prices to an average that's below $3 for many years to come. So we've We've got a, a, a lot of opportunity to, to grow demand with low prices in that range. With that said, there's more LNG liquefaction trains on the books than is warranted to meet that demand uh, uh, from an international perspective uh, in Asia. But we do expect to see at least three projects receive fin a financial investment decision in the next year. Uh, uh, our, our picks uh, out of the projects that are currently on the books would, would have to be uh, Chenier Energy uh, uh, moving forward with another train. And, and perhaps at least uh, uh, ExxonMobil uh, uh, moving forward with the Golden Pass. And, and if, if, if things go right for Canada, LNG uh, Canada's project up in Canada. Uh, to, I'm going to hand this over to Gordon to see if he can uh, touch on the cause and effect of this additional production as well. Yeah, thank, thank you, Shane. Uh, so following on from Shane, uh, on the crude side, uh, we're continuing to see more, a lot more pipeline and storage projects to, to support this uh, increasing domestic production and obviously the subsequent export. Uh, from a pipeline side, we're seeing more projects to get crude to the Gulf Coast, i.e. Houston, Corpus and or southern Louisiana. And above all that, we've got more terminal work to load larger vessels uh, for export. Uh, and finally and further, we are starting to see a small number of refined product terminals and associated pipelines uh, to cover increased demand from countries like Mexico, etc. Shane, I'd like to come back to you uh, and just stick with the, the gas story and, and take a bit of a look at the, the, the midstream. Now, we're seeing a, a quite noticeable ramp up in NGL recovery, which, you know, the last time we really saw that kind of spike, uh, was in the 2013 to 2015 timeframe. So what's driving that kind of buildup again? It's really the associated gas production and the tight oil plays, especially in the Permian, but but also in the Midcon and in the scoop and stack plays and DJ Basin, uh, where gas processing infrastructure hasn't existed like we already had in the Eagleford and the Haynesville plays. Uh, 2018 is expected to see the largest leap in natural gas output ever. Uh, like I said earlier, it's going to be up about 8 BCF higher than this time last year. And, and gas processing startups uh, in, in the right-hand side reflect that. Uh, the chart on the left shows where this has taken place. There's about 3.8 BCF a day of, of NGL recovery capacity that's scheduled to kick off in the Permian this year alone. Uh, elsewhere, throughout the Southwest, margins are returning along with utilization rates, and we expect to see new projects come about as many operators will be preparing to maximize ethane recovery at, at some of their existing plants. Uh, One Oak Partners had mentioned uh, at the end of, of last year that ethane rejection would add another 200 million in annual earnings growth across their gas processing fleet. And we expect to see implant capex such as control upgrades, uh, resid compressor additions, and deethanizer column projects get announced in the next year as well. Next slide. So this is just looking at the uh, pipeline takeaway projects that are under development. There's there's over 34 billion in natural gas pipeline projects uh, uh, in active development to take gas from one market to another. This just illustrates the flow changes that are planned for startup between now and 2020. 
the price disparity uh, between gas in the Northeast and Marcellus, uh, Marcellus still has to be resolved with key takeaway projects. Associated gas production growth in the Midcon and Permian is going to require additional takeaway capacity there to the Gulf Coast, export markets, and additional pipelines to Mexico. For 2018, there's about 82 pipeline projects worth about $9.5 billion scheduled to start construction. $7 billion for pipe and another $2.5 billion for compression facilities. That's a little over $3 million horsepower for compression in total that we're adding. Uh, elsewhere in areas such as New England, eastern New York, New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, and the Carolinas are likely to continue to be stressed on the supply side as, as pipeline projects are having a difficult time to move forward. Now, if we could shift gear a little and, and, and head north, guys, into Canada, um, I, I would like to stay with you a little longer, Shane, if I may. Uh, could you just give us a, an update on, on, on the gas market in particular and what kind of spending we're expecting to see? Well, in Canada, we, we're experiencing very low gas prices and, and, and a lack of ability to get that gas out of the region. Uh, the, the real focus right now is on the liquids-rich play, plays in general. Uh, Alberta is going to remain a very attractive place for liquids-rich production, and this is going to require additional processing capacity. Uh, the existing gas processing plants that were built in the 60s and 90s are underutilized because they're not located in areas where production has been growing. Uh, NGL demand from domestic petrochemicals is going to remain strong, and Alberta's feedstock infrastructure incentives program is going to eject another $500 million in loan guarantees and grants to support midstream projects. So we expect to see an additional $1 billion of NGO recovery trains, fractionation, and pipeline construction in Canada in the next two years, with the focus really being on the Montenay and Duverne region to feed the petrochem plants coming online in the 2021-22 timeframe, and possibly uh, more if we see Shell's LNG Canada project move forward, which alone uh, is a $36 billion project that's received a great deal of tax incentives as of late to attract positive investment decision. If Shell and LNG Canada moves forward, you're going to see a $4 billion coastal gas link project uh, added to the list of $7 billion in pipeline projects proposed right now to take gas out of Alberta to growing domestic market areas. Uh, Gordon, I know oil sands is, is still looking for outlets as well to take oil out of the country. Can you shed any light on the progress that they're making? Um, yeah, thanks, Shane. Uh, it, it's a similar story to some of the gas pipelines. And when considering oil sands, uh, Canada has lots of potential, but it's been he held up in, in what I would say every way unmanageable. Just when oil sand projects were looking to move forward, more pipeline delays have appeared. For instance, Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain project <clears throat> essentially has Alberta, British Columbia, and the federal government of Canada fighting over the future of the line and who has the final say. However, uh, on a more positive note, we are beginning to come across other companies investing in efficiency upgrades, demodel making projects in order to somewhat lower their operating costs, uh, as well as we're beginning to see um, a slight increase in maintenance activity. Now, Gordon, I'd just like to, to stay, stay with you a little. Um, you know, I, I touched earlier on this sort of ever-increasing uh, U.S. production volume that just really doesn't seem to sort of hold up. Do you see that these kind of levels of production growth, do you see, see these as sustainable? And, and, and do you think it could actually unbalance the market a little bit? Um, Shaheen, I, I have to agree with your opening, yeah, when you made your opening remarks about the uh, global oil demand um, in that 2018 and 2019 growth remained steady uh, and, dare I say, looks to be quite strong. Um, underpinning all of this is the strongest global economic fundamentals in a decade. decade sorry. Um, U.S. production uh, averaged about 9.3 million barrels per day in 2017. And by all accounts, is forecast to average 10.3 million barrels per day for 2018. And uh, per a recent the EIA forecast, they uh, could even surpass, surpass 11 million barrels per day by late 2019, and perhaps earlier. Um, almost all of this growth is proposed to come out of the Permian Basin in West Texas, and that growth is going to fuel midstream development over this same time, time period. Shane, uh, Shaheen, sorry, could you bring up the next slide? Um, I, I have to bring in the Gulf of Mexico here. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, 
is not always taken into account. So now looking at the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, uh, you, for this off, offshore region, is contributing to the overall oil and gas production by some 1.6 million barrels per day as of January this year, uh, which is not insignificant, I might say. Now, when you compare this to the previous slide, this would place it above the Eagleford play that is on its own producing 1.3 per day million barrels per day. Uh, but still a lowly second compared to the Permian play producing about 2.6 million barrels per day. Um, going further, still the U.S. Uh, Gulf of Mexico is, is anticipated to add another 300,000 to 400,000 barrels per day by late 2019. Um, and just of note, operators have delayed FID on several of the larger new developments, but are proceeding with smaller, less capital intensive alternatives to achieve similar results. Uh, that would be such as uh, subsea tie-ins, etc. Also, when producers are faced with the choice of high-cost offshore development versus lower-cost, quicker return offshore shale development, uh, the latter is typically the choice. Uh, despite this, producers are aware that there is a long-term objective uh, and the money will have to be invested soon, so keep that to keep them in the lead in the future. And I think on the left-hand side, uh, you can see some of the future spending that we're looking at. Uh, Shaheen, could you maybe bring up the next slide? Uh, okay, now that we have discussed uh, all the current production and future projections, uh, there's still a need for transporting uh, what I would call the black gold to demand centers for processing by local refiners or to export. And we're currently tracking somewhere around about 44 billion of new crude oil pipeline activity, an increase of 3 billion since our last update, uh, around about October last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, referencing the table on the lower left, there could be a sharp increase in sp pipeline spending this year as a result of the three, three projects that could move forward. Let's start up north with Canada. Mm -hmm. We'll need more pipelines built through to 2030 to transport an additional 1.3 million barrels of expected increase of oil uh, for, out of the oil sands production uh, to various markets across North America and exporting around the world. We're still tracking three pipelines to move oil sand barrels from Western Canada. Two of the three are tied up with the legal proceedings and the KXL is awaiting FID. Further come, the increase in planned project activity can be attributed to additional takeaway capacity planned for the Permian Basin, which we've discussed earlier. In the beginning of 2017, there were three projects planned, but over the past four months or so, another eight have been identified, bringing the total to 11 pipelines that could carry over potentially 2.6 million barrels per day. In the short term, pipeline operators are focused in this area. A pipeline connectivity in North America will, just, will give producers more access to global markets as the U.S. continues to ship more overseas to places like Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Thanks, Gordon. Shane, uh, I'd like to conclude our review of North America before we move into some of the other markets and, and, and put you back on the spot. Could you just sort of give us a walk through uh, what you're tracking uh, associated with this midstream build out um, and, and what are some of the, the key takeaways for, for, for folks on the call today? Well, I mean, this is my version of, of Shaheen, and, and, and that's looking at the fact that we have an incredibly large pool of projects to, that are under development across North America. I and mean, if you look at this year alone, there's $136 billion in active development with the construction kickoff date of 2018. Uh, so we, we've gone back to our project teams to evaluate which projects have a reasonable likelihood to move forward. And we've come up with our forecast for what the spending uh, should look like over, over the next uh, a couple of years. Um, Projected supply and demand of balances and permitting may cause a lot of project delays, and we realize that over the next year. But as we look forward, we believe we're going to see about $33 billion per year spent on midstream infrastructure investment. And we're ca cautiously optimistic that in addition to the smaller scale LNG projects that we see moving forward this year, that we're going to witness some of the first large LNG trains uh, required for the next wave to receive approval this year uh, with construction kickoff uh, uh, 
starting in, in 2019. Uh, so in the forecast, we include two LNG trains and the 2019 uh, kickoff forecast. Uh, the forward spend is going to continue to be focused where producer economics are the best, such as this, the Permian and the scoop and stack plays for, for crude and, and the Marcellus and Utica for natural gas. Thanks, Shay. Now, I wanted to make sure that um, we freed up sufficient time on some of the other bigger Latin American markets. And so, Gordon, I, I, I'd like to kick, kick this section off with you. Could you give us a walk through of some of the main spending areas that you're tracking and uh, certainly how, the, how the, the, the recent energy reform program that's been implemented, how, how is that shaping or reshaping the profile investments being planned and, and moving forward? Uh, Shaheen, yes, on the reform uh, of their uh, hydrocarbons in Mexico. Um, as most of us are aware, Mexico enacted legislation uh, last April allowing other companies, uh, albeit other than Pemex, to import fuel for the first time since the 30s, 1930s that is, uh, to meet rising petroleum product demand. Pemex's national pipeline system is a fraction of the size of, say, a network in Texas, so cargoes tend to be carried by truck, eh, which comes at a high price. Storage capacity at ports is strained, uh, as Pemex imports more, more gasoline to compensate for declining domestic output. The lack of infrastructure to, tr to transport and store fuel eh, is leading to planned storage and refined product pipeline projects. Eh, as I said, to lower their costs. Um, just going on, a further step forward was taken in January this year when Mexico's uh, National Hydrocarbon Commission accepted bids on 19 of the 29 par parcels at auction for the, the Gulf of Mexico and mainly the deep water. And it's interesting to note that the, one of the most successful bidders at the auction was Shell, which won nine of the 19 blocks that were awarded. Um, and further, also, according to the Energy Ministry, companies from a number of countries have committed to invest, they say, more than $150 billion in Mexico's oil and gas industry. Um, now, finally, according to the IEA investments, totaling $640 billion, or some $26 billion per year, will be needed to um, achieve their goal of a uh, historic high oil production levels approaching three and a half million barrels per day. Um, now, just to finalize on Mexico, um, obviously uh, this new offshore activity will not be seen in our two-year outlook. Um, so I'll pass this on to uh, Shaheen to explain where the, we think the real CapEx focus will be over the, the next two years. Uh, I think, thank you, me, uh, on on Mexico. If you can just go back to uh, uh, one slide, Sheehan. Uh, as Gordon, uh, Gordon has said, while investments pouring, pouring in by uh, former PMEX held onshore and offshore leases, most of the production is going to be crude related. Um, on the gas side, the third round of bending in the Burgas Basin are, are really too small to prevent further dry gas production declines. So today in Mexico, uh, they import about 84% of their gas uh, consumed which nearly all comes from the U.S., either by pipeline or as LNG. So the, the CapEx focus in the next two years is still going to be centered around natural gas pipeline uh, build-out to allow Mexico to switch uh, many existing power stations from fuel oil and to add new power generation, which now stands at about uh, 20 gigawatts of uh, additional uh, combined cycle power plants starting up uh, by 2020. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is greatly going to reduce power generation power generating costs in Mexico, which has been running on more expensive fuel oil and importing LNG. In Mexico, there's 28 natural gas pipeline projects totaling about $6.3 billion in development, a little over 6,800 kilometers total. But all that attention right now is on the delayed startup of several lines that, that if operational today, Mexico would be consuming an additional 2 BCF rather than the expensive fuel oil and LNG imports for power. There's, there's another $3 billion in gas pipeline and, and compressor pro projects scheduled to start construction over the next two years. Uh, several new pipeline projects are expected to double the U.S. gas export capacity to Mexico, but they face delays. And, and the chart above provides an update of the current startup date for these key pipelines that are going to allow gas, gas demand uh, in Mexico to grow up, up to 8 BCF a day from the 4.2 BCF a day that the U.S. currently exports to Mexico by around 2020. 
Uh, outside of our current forecast period, Mexico's uh, domestic gas production could start to phase out U.S. gas pipeline imports, but this wouldn't start until the mid-2020s, and it's going to require uh, at least $15 billion in midstream development before the, the uh, onshore fields could make a dent on U.S. gas uh, pipeline imports. Shane, if I could just keep you on the hook, and, uh, and we're just going to take a very brief look in the interest of time, uh, Shane, just a quick look at middle America. Um, could you just walk us through or just give us a couple of key highlights for this uh, for this market, albeit a, a small market? Well, just briefly, uh, Trinidad and Tobago is still going to be focused on offshore gas production drilling and the construction of a new platform and FPSO, along with the support pipelines to increase gas production lot that's been lost over previous years due to the lack of investment. So that's going to continue. And Guyana, the Lisa FPSO is expected to start up operations in 2020, and already ExxonMobil has started the potential uh, Lisa Phase Two FPSO development. And uh, Panama uh, is developing two LNG regasification terminal projects with a third under study. Uh, the recent expansion of the Panama Canal is making way for BOPAC and, and Puma Energy to invest in new refined products terminals in uh, Bahia Las Minas and at Cologne City. Also, the uh, Panama authorities are working towards exploration and drilling for crude oil fields there as well. In uh, Guatemala, their focus is, is on the development of a gas pipeline infrastructure to import gas from Mexico and additional crude production drilling as well. And that leaves us with El Salvador to start construction of their first LNG regasification terminal, albeit small. This, this is going to start construction this year to feed uh, existing uh, uh, infrastructure. El Salvador, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and Honduras are all expanding refined products import infrastructure, and Nicaragua with, uh, with some additional crude oil storage, and that pretty much wraps up uh, middle America. Uh, Shane, we've, we've got a couple of slides just remaining, um, so uh, just keeping you, keeping you engaged. Uh, we've taking a bit of a deeper look at, at, at the broader picture for South America. Now, we've obviously a very varied set of economies in terms of economic health and obviously a wide range of natural resources on offer. Um, and for, obviously for no other reason that, uh, as we can see here, that there is slightly more gas spending. Uh, could you just walk, start by walking us through some of the key points uh, and some of the main drivers that's shaping that $19 billion of planned investment? Well, the majority of the spend in South America is going to be focused on, on Brazil and Argentina in the coming years. But uh, elsewhere, uh, and we've got a slide set aside for those countries, uh, so I'll just focus on, on some of the other uh, hotspots. Uh, in Colombia, production declines have led to import projects, including development of a second LNG FSRU for energy security. The first uh, FSRU that they brought online has only received a couple of cargo so far, but that's only directly tied to some power plants. The second project would be tied to the actual uh, gas pipeline infrastructure, and they uh, expect to get more utilization out of that project if it can start construction in the next couple of years. Uh, their key focus is on a number of pipeline projects which have been delayed from previous years that are still under development. That totals about $7 billion in investment. Uh, we, we do expect 2018 to be a better climate for new construction over the previous two years on higher oil prices, but the big issue in Colombia, the leftist rebel groups are attacking pipeline infrastructure, and uh, the local com communities are, are protesting and blocking access to some of the production fields there. Uh, in Chile, domestic production is low, but it's rebounding, and there's a promising development in southern Chile and the uh, Magallanes uh, area, but not enough to displace uh, LNG imports so far. They've got a couple LNG import projects there that have run into some environmental permit delays, and there are now some doubts being cast on whether one or both will move forward with the advancements of renewable energy and also in Argentina as being a potential uh, a com a country that can send exports to Chile. In, uh, in Bolivia, Repsol, Petrobras, and Shell are going to be investing about $1.6 billion in, to increase natural gas output after years of low exploration development. Uh, Bolivian production otherwise would not be enough to meet their uh, current export commitments with Brazil, uh, they currently export to Brazil, and they've they've had uh, a lot of domestic demand growth uh, increase because they've started up a number of remotely located small-scale LNG regasification f uh, facilities across the country. That's that's now consuming a lot more more gas from their existing uh, uh, production. Uh, so there's over the next year, we're going to see about a billion dollars in additional pipeline compression and processing start construction in Bolivia. 
in Venezuela, oil production declines of, of oil are down another 20 percent so, since last year. We don't expect to see a lot of gas projects move forward there. Uh, I'll just hand this over to Gordon to see uh, it, what we can expect to move forward in Venezuela. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Shane. Uh, well, there's not much to be said about Venezuela uh, over and above what most of us are, are keenly aware of, such as a major currency devaluation and uh, p political situation that's keeping uh, international companies from investing in the country. Uh, with that said, we are tracking some one billion or so of spend over the next couple of years, some of which is related to pipelines, uh, maintenance activity, as well as a, what I would call a somewhat major spend covering expansion to an existing NGL fractioning plant. Right, into our second to final slide and, and a particular look at Brazil. Um, now, Gordon, keeping you on the hook, we've obviously seen some real challenges for the Brazilian oil and gas sector over the last couple of years, and, and that's really knocked spending levels a lot lower. But there does appear to be something of a, a corner being turned with a little bit more attention uh, being given to Brazil by some of the big IOCs. Um, would you say that that statement's correct? Um, yes, Shaheen, I think it is correct. And uh, as we're uh, a bit short in time, I'll, I'll keep this to a minimum. Uh, there appears to be a, an upsurge in project activity, and this to me uh, says that Brazil is, is in fact now turning the corner from a number of years of uh, lower activity due to the well-known low oil prices as well as the uh, very well-known uh, political scandals uh, in the country. Um, in particular, we are tracking some 20 or so FPOs that will be located offshore uh, in the pre-salt basin and are due for start-up uh, between now and 2020. Uh, with Petrobras pulling out of its onshore shallow water assets, as well as getting out of some of its midstream sector, this should provide them with greater liquidity for investment in their key focus areas. And the chart to the left provides a um, fairly extensive breakout of where by product description uh, the spend is likely to be allocated. Um, and although oil and gas production dominates the spend over the next years, uh, 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 roughly about 60%, uh, the north of Brazil is expecting to see quite a bit of activity uh, related to LNG import terminals. Much of this activity is due to limited domestic gas production, um, as we know much of that role uh, has been offshore, uh, 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 with associated gas being used to support offshore a reinjection for increased oil production. In co conjunction with the various LNG imports, uh, pipelines will be needed to get the gas to in industrial users as well as power users up in the north. Right, Shane, uh, our last slide, and, and bearing in mind the weighting towards uh, gas-related spending, you've got the honour of, uh, of walking us through some of the trends that we're seeing particular to, uh, to this market. Well, in Argentina, the uh, President Macri is is throwing everything in the kitchen sink to to get investment into Argentina. Uh, he's got new agreements between the oil companies and the workers' unions. Uh, we haven't seen any strikes in the last year, uh, which is good news. Uh, there's the taxes on oil exports have been removed. Uh, tariffs have been cut on used oil equipment coming into the country, and they've even set a firm price of uh, paying seven dollars and fifty cents for new gas production. Uh, that'll gradually reduce through 2020, but they're paying more for domestic gas production than they are for LNG imports to stimulate investment. And, and that's why we're seeing about $6 billion in investments come in from BP, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, Shell, even Statoil Oil in total, among others. And uh, now now with the, the, the sand needed for fracking uh, being worked out, uh, that's being locally produced, uh, uh, we can start to see fracking start to take off in, in that country. Uh, Overall, gas production in 2018 is expected to be up uh, significantly, about 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and this is enabling uh, President McCree to set a new goal to displace LNG imports by 2021. It's a lofty goal, but uh, production from shell gas was not dis actually expected to be able to push out LNG for another 10 years uh, just a short time ago. Uh, and now they're looking at doing that by 2022, uh, yeah, as there is thought to be t way too much infrastructure to build up before this could occur. Uh, but currently, there's about a billion dollars in gas gathering and processing and another $3.6 in active pipeline development, including the water pipelines planned to start construction in the next year and a half. Um, in total, we're tracking about $9.5 across the country in midstream uh, build-out. 
Um, but in the next five years, we'd, we'd expect there to be about 19 billion uh, for uh, Argentina to become a net, net exporter of gas uh, from their country. Sheen? Uh, it looks like we've we've lost Shaheen. This is Gordon here. Um, we've, we'll scroll through a, a, a few of the the final um, slides, which uh, we would like to thank uh, first of all our partner Parker, um, and uh, thank them for their contribution to this. Um, past webinars you will find uh, on our website, and we've got a couple of up and coming uh, webinars uh, that uh, will interest people. So all in all, thank you very much for listening. And sorry for that slight glitch at the end, uh, but uh, thank you very much for attending. Goodbye.